Okay, um, good morning everyone. Welcome back once again to Loring Hall to the first session of the Leading Together event. The panel discussion on the topic, Indigenous Communities Shaping the Future of Education and Pedagogy. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be moderating this very special session. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to introduce our very important and knowledgeable panelists who will be sharing their insights for this morning's discussion. We have with us here Dr. Ketu Kre, who is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Koima College under Nagala University. She has been working in the field of education for approximately 13 years, and she is a fellow at the Highland Institute, Koima Nagaland. She was awarded the Zuban Sasakawa Peace Foundation grant for young researchers from Northeast India in 2021. Her academic and research interests include uh, borderland and border communities in South Asia, identity politics in Northeast India, peace and conflict resolution, human rights, particularly the marginal groups such as women, indigenous communities, minorities, and persons with disabilities. She's also undertaken and completed research projects, some of which include a study on the borderland communities along the Indo-Myanmar border, with special reference to the Kiamingyung Nagas, which was funded by the Center for South Asian Studies, Guwahati University. And another very interesting project that she's worked on, from which we would like to hear more from her, uh, is on the mainstreaming the lived experiences of persons with disabilities in Nagaland, a gender perspective. And now she's currently working on an ICS, it's our funded major research project, I'm told, titled Living at the Periphery, Territory, Culture and Identity of the Tikir Nagas, a scheduled tribe in Nagaland near the Indo-Myanmar border. Thank you for uh, agreeing to be the panelists and coming all the way from Koyama to be a part of this discussion. The next we have here, I'll start with I'll start with the ladies and finish off with the man with the man last, Dr. Dolly Kikon. Uh, of course, she needs no introduction. I think she is a well-known uh, personality, but just let me allow me to just mention a few highlights about her. Uh, Stan, she's a Stanford alumni and an associate professor in the Anthropology and Development Studies program in the University of Melbourne. Her work focuses on political economy of extractive resources, militarization, migration, development initiatives, gender relations, food cultures, and human rights in India. She is a woman of many, many accomplishments and capabilities, very reputed and well-known in the academic circles. And I know uh, with a, such a strong love for indigenous communities, and of course, she's also another a very prolific writer whose current writing projects include uh, ongoing book manuscript on fermenting cultures and a report on the impact of the 2020 Bakhchan oil spill in Assam. She has also directed and produced an ethnographic film titled Seasons of Life, Foraging and Fermenting Bamboo Shoot During Ceasefire. As an engaged anthropologist, Dr. Kikon is one of the lead researchers for the Recover, Restore, and Decolonize Initiative it's a community-led movement to start dialogues on repatriation of indigenous Naga ancestral human remains from the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford University. We will also be having a panel discussion on this uh, tomorrow. And she has recently, I had the pleasure of uh, recently attending uh, her book, a uh, book launch titled uh, Food Journey, Stories from the Heart, published by Zuban Books, New Delhi. Uh, she's one of the editors of the books. And I just heard that yesterday she also launched another book, Life and Dignity. Um, so uh, really, uh, congratulations to all of these accomplishments. Dr. Kikon was honored uh, as a Lok Kavor champion in 2022, 2022 for her work on indigenous food practices in India. So that's Dr. Dolly Kikon. Now I would like to move on to introducing our next panelist, Mr. Kevin Sato Sanyo, who is the founder of Naga Ed. Naga Ed is a digital education firm where Kevin Sato and his team, they supply digital education services tailored for tribal and indigenous communities. 
Gavi Sato's professional trajectory initially led him to conservation, where he dedicated his early career to bolstering environmental legislation and policies for endangered species, wilderness expanses, and rainforests in his adopted homeland of Australia. So prior to relocating to Nagaland, Gavi Sato was working at RMIT University Australia at the Center of Academic Quality and Excellence, where he fashioned academic quality appraisal mechanisms for the 500 plus programs on offer. Gavi Sato is also a member of the National Committee on Skill Development and Livelihood at the Confederation of Indian Industry and an advisory board member of UPSOL. Here we have it, the three panelists for uh, this morning who will be sharing with us their perspectives and their uh, knowledge on the future of education and pedagogy. Uh, I think we would all agree that indigenous communities around the world really have so much to offer with regard to their history, their culture, their ways of knowing that are sometimes intentionally or unintentionally suppressed or sidelined. And in the recent years, there has been a really strong push in incorporating indigenous perspectives into education and pedagogy, all in an effort to create much more inclusive and culturally relevant learning environments. So with this focus on indigenous communities, I think in a world where uh, there is always just so much going on and so much noise, so many issues to focus on, what we're all here to do this morning uh, in this panel is to really just offer the respect and the recognition to the way these indigenous communities approach teaching and learning. So uh, I'd like to invite all of the students to open up their minds and um, to reflect on the insights that the panelists will share this morning. I'd also like to mention at this time that for all of the sessions of the conferences, we'll be having students share their reflections to conclude each of the sessions. So for this session, we'll be hearing from Arindam Joshi from Savitra Pai Pule Pune University and R. Dami Zaruvi from Stella Maris College, Chennai, after the session. So we look forward to hearing from all of you students too. Okay, so uh, for this panel discussion, I'm just, uh, we're, we'll just, have a few discussions or reflect on some questions after which I will be opening the time, giving time to the audience to ask questions. So students, you may note down questions in between and I'll give you time to put out your questions to this panelists um, afterwards. So to start off with, I would like to um, ask Dr. Dolly Kikon. Um, you've been working very closely with indigenous communities on a number of projects um, from food, sea sovereignty, gender injustice, um, so much more. Drawing from all of the experiences that you've had uh, amongst the indigenous communities, how do you feel that we can better incorporate all of this experience, the indigenous experience or indigenous perspectives into the education system and our pedagogy? Thank you so much, and I apologize if you thought that I was scrolling my phone and not listening to Harissa. I was trying to find an email that I received, um, I think two days ago, from a student. Um, and I received quite a number of emails from students that I don't know. And I think that's something quite distinct that I would like to highlight, because um, I do receive emails for peer reviews, you know, as, as, an, as an academic, that's what we do, uh, to uh, examine uh, thesis, PhD thesis as an external examiner. Um, but I think what is exceptional that I find in my own standing and my own experience as a, as a scholar, and you know, we call it a tribal scholar, we call it indigenous scholar here, is a lot of students write to me um, about, about just their feelings. Right? It's not that they want anything from me. They just tell me that, you know, Professor Kikon, we just want, wanted to, or I just wanted to make sure that you know what I'm feeling right now. And so I was trying to very quickly find that email. Uh, maybe if I find it, I'll read it out. But it's about students from indigenous communities, from marginalized communities, 
uh, in India writing to me, uh, where often there will be a sentence which 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 says, you know, um, I thought I was go going mad, or or I thought, you know, what I was feeling was insane because this this there are very few professors out there who even um, validate what I'm feeling. They think that I'm just stupid, you know, until I came across your work or your lecture online or you know an essay that you wrote. And now I feel that I'm not mad. Right? It's it's almost uh, how can I say it's almost uh, to a level of insanity that students are driven from marginalized communities, from indigenous communities to feel what we feel, uh, to look at the worldview that we have and try to theorize or try to conceptualize to understand the world around us. A uh, one, it's I think then to say something really, really heavy, like educational institutions, higher educational institutions, being an accomplice in this pedagogical violence. Uh, second, in a sense of having student community, especially research communities, often have that nature of intellectual bullying to tell students from marginalized communities to say that your experiences don't matter. Right? If you are a Dalit in India, your experiences don't matter. Uh, if you are an Adivasi, a tribal, your experiences don't matter. You have to constantly adapt and adopt to the dominant framework. And I feel that that needn't be the case, given the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of, I think, uh, worldviews that we bring. One of the things that I often say very proudly is the ability for us as indigenous people to inherit and to have that in us um, about storytelling. And I say that for all children who were brought up, I think, in, around indigenous cultures, both indigenous, non-indigenous families, to say what kind of storytelling methods we have. Any kind of philosophy, theory that, that we look at around the world Storytelling and how we listen is so integral and important. So I feel that the kind of, um, I think, projects that you have named for yourself from the seed, sovereignty, uh, from my association with food, justice, I think it's been to draw deeply from where I come from, this land, and to value that with so much challenges that we have around structural inequality, uh, structural violence, the history of militarization, that is also part of our present, and how do we then begin to heal? So my justice work has also been around that, and I feel that I think there need to be a deeper commitment and an honesty to the land that we belong, to, to values like, I think, compassion. We often don't talk about compassion and education in the same sentence. There's such a heightened way of talking about intellectual, and higher education projects that almost disassociates lived realities. Um, you know, I feel that as a Naga scholar, we cannot go to the world and tell them that we have made it until and unless the most vulnerable and the most, I think, um, uh, marginalized people within our community, Nagas, non-Nagas who have adopted Nagaland as home begin to walk the journey with us. I think that's been my commitment and we can carry the conversations further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences and those reflections. I'll pick up on some of those uh, topics that you highlighted uh, later too. The second question I'd just like to direct to Dr. Uh, Getu Kreyer who, as an educationist with 13 years experience in Nagaland, uh, what are your thoughts on integration of indigenous knowledge systems into this mainstream educational curricula? Before I answer the question and share my views, I would like to thank the administration of Tetsu College for inviting me to be a part of this great event. Uh, as I entered the campus, I felt like it's a 
pre-Christmas celebration. And I really wonder how you guys pulled it together because in Kohima we are so busy with conducting our exams and here you are so, you know, so coolly doing your own stuff very beautifully. I really appreciate the students, the faculty and staff for doing this amazing work. I'm also very, very happy to be sharing this panel with my model, Madam uh, Dolly. She told me not to call her Madam, but she is still a Madam for me because uh, as she was sharing, I often, you know, are... Uh, uh, wrote mails to her and she graciously, every time I wrote something, she graciously, uh, you know, replied. Uh, it was, I think, more than 10 years ago, uh, I met her for the first time in Singapore, Nation, uh, Uni National University of Singapore, and since then I have been following her work, and she has been a great source of motivation for me, uh, personally as well as professionally. I receive a lot of healing listening to your talks and reading your works. So I'm so happy to be here. I'm also very happy to be uh, sharing the same panel with uh, Kevin Sato uh, for the amazing work that he is doing. You know, we really appreciate your work and your team's work, yeah. So talking about uh, education, like uh, talking about the integration of indigenous knowledge system and the mainstream educational system, I think most of you would agree with me that for a very long time we have been following this uh, colonized or a Western uh, system of education here, even in Nagaland. And for a very long time, our indigenous knowledge or indigenous knowledge system has been neglected. And for that matter, we are at a stage that many of us, we are losing our own culture, we are losing our own identity and our language. I have a six-year-old son, today he refuses, or he finds difficult to speak in my dialect, dialect and even his father's dialect. He calls himself an Englishman and that is a very sad reality. I tried my best to teach him my dialect and insist that he also learns his father's dialect. But I think the whole system is in the, you know, the whole process of modernization and westernization that all of us we are going through. And coming to the curricula, uh, from the preschool itself, we are taught how to speak English and children would get, you know, sticks or they will get beatings from the teachers for speaking their own mother tongue or Nagamis. So that is a kind of, you know, uh, enforced educational system that we are forced to follow. But I believe that over the last few years or at least the last past decade, we have seen that we have realized that it is very, very important for us to go deep into our indigenous practices. And there are many people who are also advocating the need to incorporate the indigenous knowledge system. So we have seen uh, many um, educational institutions incorporating some part of the cultural or traditional uh, activities or practice in the, you know, in the academic calendar as well. And we have seen that. But however, we still need a very uh, kind of a very strong educational policy. I would like to bring in the National Education Policy 2020. This National Education Policy 2020 encourages the, uh, the learning of Indian uh, knowledge system. So for that matter in Nagaland, I think instead of, I'm not saying that we should not go for Indian uh, indigenous knowledge system, but I would propose that educational institutions, educators, and even parents, we should think about how we can incorporate uh, indige Naga indigenous knowledge system or the indigenous knowledge system of the North is into the mainstream educational curriculum. And uh, for that, we need people who can work on curriculum development. Uh, first of all, planning, design, and development, which we found very much missing in our land. So I think um, there is a great need, and it's an urgent call. And I think that uh, this is a very a good platform for us to think about uh, you know, integrating not just the curriculum as well, but also the teaching methodologies, the teaching aids, and the tools which we can use in our own indigenous way to impart knowledge to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ketukri. I'm really glad that you mentioned about curriculum develop development because I think that's something at the core of what many of our educators in Nagaland really need to get in 
better, closer touch with. And I think that's also what Naga Ed is doing. So I'd just like to request uh, Mr. Kevin Sato to please tell us more about what Naga Ed's involvement towards you know, shaping the future of education through indigenous uh, knowledges has been so far. Uh, so when we started out uh, Naga Ed, uh, I was calling my partner Shiroi, uh, and we were looking at different areas uh, in which we could contribute to our community. That was kind of our guiding, um, uh, guiding star. Uh, the question was, what is our contribution to our community? And we found that, and I think my way here, is education was one of the greatest needs for our community. Um, and as highlighted uh, by our other panelists as well, is that uh, the education system that we have right now is unbalanced. So we've been hyper-optimized, uh, inherited a British system, hyper-optimized uh, under the Indian system for a particular output, uh, which is sitting your board exams, because the, it's directly linked to livelihoods. So the majority of our jobs uh, come from government. Uh, we have some of the highest rates of government employment uh, in the country. And so if a young person wants to get educated and have a livelihood, it's directly linked to getting a job in the government, which is directly linked to uh, performance in your board exams. So it's really crowded out the space for our indigenous practices uh, and the way that we uh, practice knowledge in under our Maroon system. Uh, mainly under the Maroon system, it's tied to our village. You know, we had the sovereignty of our village that was the peak of our culture, uh, coming from our family, our clan, our kel, uh, and then to our village. And our knowledge and our indigenous practices is about how do we contribute to that sovereign village. Right? How do we have a community-based system that we live uh, symbiotically with our fellow people in the village and with the natural world. And so that's how I define uh, our indigenous practices or indigenous knowledge. So in understanding that that space is now crowded out, how do we then uh, bring back or how do we maintain balance? And in those areas to align with our indigenous practices, we've identified two additional areas uh, in addition to the academic areas. So one is essential skills. So under the Murung, under uh, uh, the village lifestyle, your education is what are the essential skills that you need to live and work. Uh, and that is what was taught. The other one part we call lessons for living, which is how are you a contributing member to your village community? And we've expanded that to how are you a contributing member to your uh, global village community? But essentially, it ties back to our relationship with our village uh, and our relationship with people in that village and our relationship to the nature around that village. So how do we bring aspects? So we've looked at it in three different pillars for the company, uh, looking essentially our academics, so our, our uh, leading up to our board exams, uh, aligning ourselves with the NEP. But in addition to that, uh, adding those areas of essential skills uh, that might be different now in the world that we live in, but essentially skills to survive and thrive in the world that we find ourselves, uh, and lessons for living. How do we build moral fortitude? How are we contributing members to our community? And I think that ties directly uh, to the values of our indigeneity uh, and how we identify as indigenous peoples. All right, thank you so much for sharing on that. Um, so with regard to this whole uh, imparting of indigenous knowledge and integrating it into education now, uh, we've talked about compassionate education, um, looking at how, looking more closely at what students, indigenous students face. I think Dr. Dolly had mentioned that at her, in her opening statement about being given recognition or be, being acknowledged on the feelings that students are need to grapple with, with modernity, with tradition. How, and I ask this question to all of the panelists here, um, how do we change this narrative? Uh, how do we help them decolonize the existing narratives of being told, you know, to, how, how would they negotiate with this tradition and with this modern education system 
what would be your response to the students to best uh, address this complexity that they are faced with at a time when the push towards technology is so strong, push towards modernity and new age learning methods are so strong, but at the same time, we're being told to focus on indigenous knowledges, your practices. How do they um, negotiate with this type of engagement as they also try to be modern citizens globally, uh, global citizens of this world, at the same time be in touch with their indigenous identity? Um, I put that question to any of the panel, all of you, if you could share a response on that, that would be great. Hawesa, thank you so much for the question. And I have no answer to that because it's so big and I think it's a, it's a thought in pro progress for all of us, right? It's daunting. Um, I think many Nada students are still first generation in many ways where the parents, both mother and father, hasn't finished high school or at the most college dropouts. And all of a sudden the jump that we are having to the global, I would say, uh, through technology, uh, through you know the net, through the digital world, sometimes creates quite an imbalance because the reality is that majority of us, I think in the 21st century, are going to become um, migrants, uh, are going to really be in the service industry, are really going to be faced with the reality that we have very minimum skills, right? that our shelf life I know it's quite derogatory, but our shelf life, our, our, our professional life, sometimes is going to end the moment our body breaks down. Uh, so, uh, so those are the realities. So what are we looking at? Um, I think these are, these are the realities, realities in front of us, but, but since you maybe um, use the word um, decolonize right how do how do we decolonize our mind and that's that's a process that's a topic that i have been talking about as an educator myself um, and like my co panelists said not looking at really at western centric educations but how do we place value here back to where we belong and sometimes it's tough sometimes it's very hard because of the past that we all inherit the the past of that we have of violence, that past that we have of colonization. Um, so in a sense, I just came back from, I think, giving some um, talks and interacting with college students and with university students in Mokokchong and in Lumami, Nagaland University. And we were talking about decolonization. I know such a weird concept. You know, that it doesn't really make sense for a lot of us. You know, we have so much happening here. And what is decolonization? Why should we care about that? So I was at this college called Jubilee College, which is in Mokokchong, and it's part of the Our Baptist Church Initiative. Um, and we, we, we saw the statue, a life statue of uh, Reverend Longri at the college, uh, one of our Naga visionaries and leaders. And we started talking about decolonization. And Sometimes I think these concepts come to us, the language that I'm speaking, English Takoyase, uh, you know, and then Nagamis is a, is a market language that came up from the foothills of the Naga Hills and Assam, when our ancestors began to trade and barter with the Brahmaputra Valley. So it's also a language. Then I also speak Lota, my mother tongue. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is, I know that you, when we talk about modernization, when you talk talk about globalization, it can be very confusing. But I think since the time of the Industrial Revolution, you know, since we have something called electricity, nothing remained the same. So if we are talking about the shock that we are going through by the digital technology media, can you imagine a few hundred years ago when people in Europe discovered electricity, how life changed, that it was no longer the lamps after sunset, it was, it was electricity, then came the photos, then came the videos, and I think we're still going through the process. So as part of the human species, what I want to tell students here is that we are going to see changes only in this lifetime of a magnitude that we can't even imagine. When that happens to you, remember, 
Never forget the ground beneath your feet. Who are you? I always tell my beloved students and my colleagues that the colonizers and those who came to conquer us knew very well who they were. They knew or they believed that they were superior to us in terms of their race, in terms of their education, in terms of their knowledge. And like our esteemed um, guest today, Abu Meta told us, we as Nagas have been studied to bits. We have been written about by all European scholars who have come to study, but what have we done, in a sense, to understand who we are? So sometimes it just starts by asking very simple questions. If the colonizers knew who they were, and if the oppressors who come to exploit us know who they are so well, do we know who we are? I think that, in a sense, resonates with the questions that my honorable co-panelists have asked about language and also about skills. So maybe I'll stop here. Uh, I resonate with a lot of what you said, uh, Dolly. Uh, something that uh, I think uh, we're struggling with is not just that uh, we're entering into a new world, but we're adapting in a very compressed timeline. So we're talking about our people, our communities, adapting to four industrial revolutions, sometimes in one generation. So I think about the way that my father lived. Uh, he was an animist. Uh, our family was not Christian initially in the beginning. And so we would sacrifice chickens to Chikeo for a good hunting season. Uh, we'd have Shekrani, we'd have our festivals. Uh, and then from then we moved into Christianity. Uh, uh, he traversed the globe. We ended up in Australia. When I was growing up, uh, I saw my first computer. Uh, I think when I was nine, and I peeked through the window of the school and there had two computers there. So, in our family, we're adapting to four industrial revolutions in one generation. Uh, and for large parts of community, in fact, more than 80% of our community, we're doing it in this generation. So not only are we adapting to that, we're also waking up to our consciousness of an indigenous people within this generation. So the idea of Nagas being indigenous as a self-identity is relatively new. The Naga identity in itself is also relatively new. From 1920s, 30s, you know, we're coined this term from others. So, uh, as uh, Dolly was saying, we really have to know ourselves. Right? Before we, uh, for us to be able to adapt and to uh, keep true uh, to our cultures, to our values, we really need to know ourselves. And for me, that really, again, as I was saying before, ties back to our village state. Right? So the core values uh, uh, in our education at a Murung level, the core values of our being is actually orientated around our village state. Uh, and so for me personally, it's about a, a practice of continually going back to your village about experiential learning, so sitting with your elders, learning with them, learning the things that they do, and try to see the world from their point of view, because it's tremendously different now from the beyond their imagination, uh, and as our co-panelists would say, the world that we're going to will be beyond our imagination now. Some of the, uh, some of the work that I did in Australia was about the future of work and how we adapt to the future of work, uh, within that realm, we have a few skill sets, right? Uh, about the changing landscape, especially as we're going into the cyber physical world. Some of those skill sets that we're talking about, we're, we've adapted to due to our political history and due to our cultural history. So, some of those being sense making, uh, collaboration. Adaptive and novel thinking, we've been pressured uh, into forming those skills. So, as we're going out into the world, as we're awakening ourselves, my hope for our generation and the generations coming up is that we 
invest in those skills that we've had since time immemorial because those are the skills and those are the coveted skills that the world is looking for today. Uh, so moving forward, uh, that's really where I would say uh, it would be great for our young people to look back and able for them to look forward. I'm just going to move on to a couple of other questions which we can try to get to um, directed it to Dr. Ketukre. Uh, speaking from the perspective of persons with disabilities, um, how can we shape our education and curricula to be more inclusive of this segment of society? We also have students from Chennai, uh, from Pune, and from various indigenous communities over here. Uh, so, different marginalized sections of society, how would we, bringing them, bringing everyone into the discussion, uh, how would we try to be more sensitive to persons with disabilities, how can we really make our education system much more inclusive? Uh, <clears throat> Before I answer that question, uh, I would like to put a disclaimer. I'm not an expert on disability studies. This is, I'm, I've just started my uh, journey into this sector. Um, I am a lifelong learner of political science and as a student of political science, I always um, you know, thought about the concepts, <clears throat> normative concepts like justice, rights, equality and all. And my work with disability started with Zuban Fellowship and for that I'm very grateful to Zuban Sasakawa Peace Foundation grant. Um, it's not that I have not known people having uh, disabilities. All my life I have been living with relatives who had uh, disabilities. I had friends who had disabilities. But uh, as a subject matter or as a discipline, I did not put attention. But through this fellowship, I uh, was somehow motivated and also forced into looking into this disability sector. Now, talking about disability issue, uh, particularly indigenous communities, we, uh, most indigenous communities, we see disability from religious or spiritual perspective. Some see it as, some see disabilities as punishment from God. Some see it as blessings. So, um, even in my work, when I had interaction with families, having members uh, with disabilities, they give their experiences, <clears throat> sharing that some of them, they think that it's a gift from God. And I was also told that there is in a particular village, a young boy uh, was dressed in traditional attire and every year during the harvest, he would be taken to his field. Uh, and they believe that whenever he accompanied his uh, parents, the harvest is bountiful. So that's the kind of attachment that they have attached with uh, being, you know, being a gift or being a blessing from God. But majority of the people, people think that disability is a curse. It's a punishment because of the sins of your parents or the sins of your ancestors. And for a very long time, we have not, uh, you know, um, thought about or talk about these persons with disability in Nagaland openly. They have been hiding for a very long time and today I'm glad that there are many special schools, there are many inclusive schools coming up, but at a larger level, these are confined mostly to Kohima and Dimapur. They are yet to make uh, you know, entry into other rural places. So I think the government has to take serious you know, um, policy decision and also see to it that the policies which are adopted are put into place properly. Now coming back to inclusive education, I think it is very, very important that education has to be inclusive. Education is one of the strongest weapons that we have as people. And I think that this particular group of people, persons with disabilities, they have to be given access to education. And for this, I think it is very, very important that we go back to the indigenous values, like uh, solidarity that we share with our own community people. We also need to think about caregiving, how we can care for one another in a, in a community, because 
um, in olden times, even the persons with disabilities, they were seen to be more integrated into the society comparing to today. Because today in town and in cities, we see that there are also avenues where these persons with disabilities are also helped and they are empowered. But there are also big sections of persons with disabilities who are hidden away from the gaze of the government, who are hidden away from uh, the, you know, the services which are available for them. So I don't know whether I'm uh, answering the question correctly or not, but this is something that really uh, troubles me because in Nagaland, yes, we have seen schools coming up, but we have seen that there are many pers uh, children with disabilities in rural areas who are you know, locked inside their houses when their farmer parents, parents who are farmers, they go to their field. And uh, early intervention could have avoided so could, could have avoided many of these uh, disabilities to a large extent. So early intervention is something that we need and also for educational institutions, I think it is very, very important that we have inclusive policy. UGC has come up with um, the inclusive guidelines. I'm not saying that anything that comes from the central is good, but what I'm saying is that it is very, very important that education sector, education department in Nagaland, both school and higher education, we have to come up with our own policies to take care of these indigenous persons with disabilities. And another thing is that at the college level or, level or even at the school level, we have to look at whether they have accessibility to the education that we are providing or not. Uh, not just physical accessibility, but attitudinal, our behavior, our attitudes toward these persons with disability, and also the social, uh, the social um, situation, how we treat these persons with disability. Today in Kohima, we have good number of uh, schools coming up with, uh, you know, these facilities for children, but most of the schools are from uh, the families who had struggled with these issues themselves. They don't want others to go through the same thing, so they have started preschools, they have started schools for, take, uh, you know, for these children with disabilities. So my greatest concern is, at the school level, we have students with disabilities. The school education department is also doing some work, and we have the data. But what happens to students in higher secondary and in college? Let me also tell you uh, the figure of iShare report, All India Survey on Higher Education, 2021. The data shows that we have only eight students with disabilities in higher education. Eight students. And in higher, uh, in school level, we have more than 2,000 students. So where, where do these 2,000 students go after they finish their class 10? This is one question that, you know, I'm trying to figure out. And this really troubles me, you know, as a teacher. So in our college, Kohima College, we have a small committee which was set up to take care of the needs of uh, students with disabilities. At right now, we have seven students identified. Uh, these students, they also have difficulty coming out, you know, and uh, accepting themselves that they are having some certain kind of disabilities. So I think for the students also, they need to accept the fact that they have such disabilities and come forward and also from, uh, from the authority, from the college management or authority side also, we should keep things in place for them, like having barrier-free access uh, infrastructure or even study materials. Now, uh, what we urgently need is we need manpower. We need teachers who are specially trained in this disability sector. And very unfortunately, I'm not an expert in this, so I just wish that we have some you know, policy intervention in creating some uh, special schools or uh, institutions specially meant for these students with disabilities so that we can also help them. And by helping them, I think we are helping ourselves because we are all part of this community. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing about that because I think um, this is one aspect that's really not talked about enough, inclusive education and thinking about the students, persons with disabilities, how do we get them access to education? Uh, really happy that Koima College has started a unit focused on these students. 
Dental College has also faced similar cases where having students bring out, speak out on their own disability and being, uh, being tagged as or, or being labeled as that becomes very difficult for them to accept. And even for the whole community, I think it's something that we're just not, we need to sensitize our community more on being much more acceptable, inclusive, to speak about it more so that we can help them out. So we've talked about uh, in, the inclusive policy educations, I think uh, po policies that need to be more inclusive towards this marginalized or neglected or non-talked about segments of students and societies. Um, and we've, I think the main, another thing about it is all about how do we bring a team of people to work together on addressing all of these issues and uh, bringing all stakeholders, educators, policy makers, to come together and frame policies that will benefit and actual, and task forces that will actually follow up on the implementation. So I'd like to uh, go back to Dr. Dolly on um, speaking about from indigenous communities. We've talked about some of the challenges. Uh, we've talked about compassion, having empathy, and more caregiving to indigenous communities and all marginalized sections. What now do you think uh, we should focus on and prioritize at this moment in time to foster faster progress, educational growth uh, within these indigenous communities? What are the key strengths and advantages of the indigenous communities that need to be prioritized? Um, I, I think at this moment, because we are having this conversation here in Dimapur, in the state of Nagaland, and the northeastern region of India has eight states. The northeastern region of India has eight states. And I think the, the focus is really government support. The focus is government support. I appreciate the government of Nagaland giving in a lot of support, aid, to music, we have the Hornbill Festival starting very soon. All of us will go, or who, who can find rooms and bookings around Kohima. Uh, but it is time that all of us in this room feel that it is time for education. It is time to devote ourselves to knowledge and knowledge making. Uh, because the challenges that my two co-panelists have shared are challenges where we need the government to step in. Uh, if we have to focus on our ancestral practices of morum knowledge, on bringing in our issues of disability within schools, within colleges, the other side of this challenge then is to have government support, education department, um, women, children, welfare department, come on board and say, listen, we are here, how do we make this okay? My fear is that because I worked with uh, Naga migrants for my second book, and I went across India looking at the kind of savings they have. And trust me, for a lot of families here, Naga families, we are, I think, just one stop away from being bankrupt the moment a family member falls ill. So no matter how much skills we have and the money we bring in, we are just one stop short of mortgaging our land, our house, our land documents, the moment a family member falls ill. This is the kind of vulnerability, this is the kind of precarity that we have. So for me, Havesa, the focus would be really to call upon the government to look into the educational institutions to make sure that we have the support. And given what my colleague this morning said, that investing in education and knowledge is a long-term investment. But we need to have that urgency to say that if we invest in disability care, in educating our indigenous, our students with disability, they will be the future leaders, writing the policies here for the state of Ga for the state government, for the country, and be the representatives, be assets, be thinkers, be philosophers for the world as well. And I think this is really key and important. The focus, my final point, should be then how do we together think about being 
in a position where we focus on education, where we are there as support even for governments to be able to write reports. Um, I often hear that the government of Nagaland has firms from Delhi, from Kolkata, from other places where they hire to write reports for state governments. And I think that practice needs to be uh, revisited. And this is for the policymakers, for the administrators, for the politicians there. Look at the skills that Naga students can bring in, that higher education can bring in, that amazing scholars sitting here in our, in our land can bring in. And I think this is what the focus on education, what the focus on knowledge can do. So my answer would be that, Harissa, to focus on government support. Along with the Hornbill, we also need the Hornbill of knowledge, wisdom, and all to be supported. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dolly. Uh, yes, uh, focus on government support. Uh, so necessary in order to help, you know, edu higher education and all of these uh, plans for implementing the national education policy or whatever new policies that have to be introduced to be made more inclusive. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Kevin Sato Naka Ed has also been doing a lot of work at the ground on training educators, creating courses or programs that would be beneficial or that's necessary to upskill our, edu our educators and the community members. Can you tell us a bit more of what are the skills? You mentioned about investing in certain skills uh, to empower our community members. What what is the work that Naga Ed is doing and what more do you think uh, needs we do we need to focus on? Thanks for the opportunity to plug in Wasa. So um, uh, I recently got back from uh, Kifri, uh, which is on the border of uh, uh, India and Myanmar. Uh, so we're working with a few schools there. We're working with the district administration. Uh, one of the key areas that we're focusing on is really uh, uplifting the teacher's capabilities. So when we're talking about uplifting education, uh, the delivery mechanism is our teachers. right? Without our, the, the learning that occurs is the relationship between the teacher and the student. So how do we maximize that opportunity? How do we maximize that time? And one of the ways that we see that possible is by leveraging technology. So uh, in going in these areas, actually, uh, when we went there, uh, you know, we, uh, we were looking at uh, the connectivity in the area. Uh, there's amazing 5G, you won't believe it. We went to Sitimi, we went to Salomi, Pukyo, we went to all these places, and Geo has built towers everywhere. I think uh, our government has an agenda about connectivity in that area. Uh, and so we were getting speeds of about 350 megabits per second. Uh, it was amazing. So one of the long barriers about uh, 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 getting digital education into these areas has been connectivity. And for these villages dotted on the border, some of those uh, issues have been resolved. Right? The second one was about getting the physical technology there. Uh, one of the amazing things that we found was that uh, during this period, the government had deployed almost a tablet to almost every student. Uh, and I think almost every government school got two smart TVs. And some of these classes, we're talking about 20, 30 students. Uh, some of the schools, we're talking about 50 or 100 students at the most. So, but despite all of this, uh, the technology wasn't being utilized. right? And so one of the key things is our community and our people's relationship with technology, uh, the accountability we have when we're given these resources, uh, how do we address that? So uh, we went there, uh, we've been, uh, we went there on a listening mission. Uh, we surveyed uh, about 800 students. Uh, we spoke to dozens of student teachers and administrators. Uh, and for us, uh, to bridge that gap and bring quality education by levering technology is really about how do we overcome these behavioral barriers uh, and this, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, like a resentment or, a, 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 not even a resentment, just a barrier with technology. So that's something that we're looking into because there's a great opportunity here. Uh, one of the great opportunities that we've had is that we can bypass uh, uh, the third industrial revolution. 
So we don't have to go through that whole mechanization process. We don't have to go through the extraction of the resources. I think we mentioned that moving forward, we're going to be in a very service-based industry, a knowledge-based industry. We're looking for knowledge workers. And so our indigenous value of preserving nature, uh, uh, we can continue and meet the world in the fourth industrial revolution without having to go through those same processes that other uh, uh, other communities have gone through around the world about extracting their resources. The second thing is that as we're moving forward into the fourth industrial revolution, the world is looking for certain skills that cannot be replaced by AI. Right? These skills are human skills. And these are the skills that we have because we've built them through generations, because of the structure of our villages, because we have some of the most linguistically diverse communities for a single geographic region, because we've been through tremendous uh, political turmoil. So for these reasons of our cultural history, our uh, 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 political history, we can double down on some of these skills. So for us to be able to institute education institutes for government, to be able to promote these skills, sense making, uh, uh, adoptive and novel thinking, uh, collaboration, these are the highly coveted skills. So not only can we meet the world uh, and uh, progress ourselves without extracting our natural resources, but we can also meet the world and fulfill these gaps. And then one great opportunity, last one, is that uh, the value systems that we hold in our villages, right, about respect for one another, about having a symbiotic relationship, about a communitarian ethos, and about protecting nature. These are the values that the world needs today. So for uh, uh, our institutions, for our government to be able to focus in on these areas, um, it is an opportunity to give a tremendous gift uh, to our global village. Thank you, Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I now just going to open the floor up to the audience in a minute. So students or staff, anyone who have questions, you can pose your questions to the panelists. Before we get into that, I just want to ask the same question to Dr. Kitakri on what are the key strengths and advantages do you think that in indigenous communities right now, what should we prioritize to foster faster educational growth and progress? Uh, <clears throat> right now, right now, uh, we are going through revolution even in educational system. A lot has been emphasized on the use of ICT and also artificial intelligence is something that we are all, uh, you know, uh, happy about it, but something that we should all be uh, scared of also. Because if we are not careful, we will be replaced very soon. But something that cannot be replaced is what I agree with Kevisato is that the values that we have, the, the values, the, uh, the moral values that each one of us, uh, you know, as a part of this larger community poses. Like for example, today many people uh, in the world, they are having problem with depression. And in this fast competitive life, depression is something that is, you know, uh, that is also affecting many students and even uh, teachers, educators as well. But when we try to look at the indigenous uh, system, we see that in a community, we take care of one another. We don't, we, we do compete. No doubt that we don't, it's not that we don't compete, but our competition is not unhealthy. But in a capitalist society or in a consumerist society, which is filled with competition, which is filled with toxic 
competition. I think um, from indigenous uh, values such as caring for one another, sharing with one another, and looking at holistic approach of education. Because as we have learned, the Western uh, education is mostly for survival. But I think indigenous education, it gives meaning to our life. Not just survival, not just uh, concern about what we get to eat, but I think it also gives meaning and purpose to our life. So I think we have to go back to that, that we need to uh, care for one another as members of the indigenous community, irrespective of the differences that we have. Okay, thank you. Now I'm just gonna open up the floor to the audience in case you would like to pose any questions. I'd like to request if some volunteers can pass around the mic and you can just raise your hands and they'll bring the microphone to you. Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. This was a very interesting discussion. I've uh, really enjoyed myself and learned a lot. Um, my name is Lika Chopi and I'm from the psychology, psychology department here in Tetsu College. I actually have quite a few questions. So to start with, I'd like to infer from my own personal experiences and say that I'm unable to properly or fluently speak in my own dialect, which is Sumi due to the fact that I was sent to hostels and boarding schools from a very young age. So, um, <clears throat> English is a language that I use to think, to dream, and to talk. And most, uh, and I feel like uh, this is not a very sustainable way of acknowledging my own heritage. So, my question for this is, as most schools will not have the resources to teach every single dialect that exists here in Nagaland, what are some realistic measures to sustain our mother, mother tongues? Go ahead. Which one of you? I'll just leave it to any one of you who would like to best answer this question. Yes, it is true that um, schools are not in a position to hire teachers for all the tribal communities because we are a uh, diverse tribal community. So there are many uh, you know, students belonging to different uh, tribal communities. I think uh, what we can do is we can have a certain kind of cluster, cluster system where uh, you know, uh, instead of going for a very formal kind of education, I think we can have a group of uh, institutions working together to provide specific, uh, you know, uh, language or a specific uh, uh, dialect. For example, here we we have Tetsu College here, we have CH, we have Patkai Christian College, uh, San Marys or whatever, then I think all these colleges can uh, come together and they can, uh, they can form a cluster and they can teach a particular or a number of languages in, and they can also help, uh, you, they can also use teachers. For example, a language teacher in Tetsu College can also, I think, uh, it's, it's quite possible to allow that teacher to work in a, another institution as well. It's not that a particular teacher appointed for a particular school not, you know, should be only working in that uh, school or college. So I think we can, uh, we can go for that. Another thing is that um, uh, at the family level, as I say personally, I'm, uh, people call me a failure as a mother because I'm not able to teach my dialect to my child. But I think uh, this is something that this struggle is something very real and we have to keep on going. We need to, uh, we cannot expect the schools to teach our dialect to our uh, children if we don't do at home. So I think uh, it comes back to our families as well. And yeah, I think some of the, some of the things you can add from that. Thank you so much for your question. It's really an important one. And I wanted to connect it back to the conversation that we're having about values, right? About Naga 
um, values, about indigenous values across the world. And in my own work, I am making a connection that the loss of our resources, including our forests, which is so important for who we are, what we eat, and how we connect to nature, the loss of our resources is in many, many aspects directly related to the increasing loss of maybe our languages and our cultural practices. Okay, one example, if you're wondering what is Dolly talking about in here, um, when you lose forests, when you lose all the resources around, what, do you, what happens? You lose plants, right? When an animal goes extinct, what happens? People stop talking about that. So everything that, is, that we are losing, we stop using those terms in our own mother tongue, in our indigenous languages. So that is also loss of language right there. And including uh, all Naga languages and many other indigenous languages here from the Eastern Himalayas, we are categorized as communities who speak endangered languages. So it's not that any of the languages that we speak is actually in the safe category. So we are re really looking at a very fast-paced uh, culture um, of, of loss at the same time as we are talking about values. Language is really important, and one of the aspects that I would want to focus is that how do we focus on one, calling out this culture of shaming. In my own family, my, my, some of my relatives, cousins, cannot speak Lota. <coughs> And they come from very special houses sometimes, you know, maybe parents died, they, they were raised in hostels, you know, went far away to live in different relatives' houses. And there's so many reasons why children grow up not being able to speak mother tongue. And I think in our own society, one thing that you and I have to do and promise is that we will not shame people our classmates, our colleagues, adults who cannot speak mother tongue. And the shaming comes from elders, from the churches, from the tribal associations. And that needs to stop because there is such a desire, a shame, and also a, a, a longing and sorrow for those who are not able to speak language. So how do we make that space? One, I would say that cultural associations are so important. Hornbill, that's happening. We have clubs going to dance. We have clubs going to sing. How about we have clubs, indigenous clubs, to learn how to speak one another's language? Um, we had a Naga delegation at the University of Melbourne, and all of us, we sang a Tenidia song. And it was so beautiful to sing, to sing that song together. Cultural associations, second, we have the Naga Students Federation, both for the Eastern Nagas and here for, for Nagaland Nagas and other Naga homelands as well. Why don't we give, as student bodies, an appeal to NSF that we need, what, to learn to speak our languages? So why can't we have those, those NSF, ENSF small units where we can meet once a fortnight and learn that? Third, the churches. The churches are really important in Naga society because the first translation of the Bible in our mother tongues were actually initiatives of the American missionaries. So today, if there is language that exists, including Lotha, Sumi, Ao, it is in our mother churches. And the mother churches sometimes are absolutely detached from children and from the reality and from the broader issues of the loss of language. So we need to go back to our mother churches and say, listen, Right? Can we have initi initiatives where we are able to speak languages? Because even among Naga cultures, you know that, right? If a Sumi and an Ao get married, can you imagine where the children will go to church? The challenges that are there, and we need to accept that with really grace, compassion, and ask the churches to come on board as well. The fourth point is student-led clubs. So very good question that you raised. Why can't we have the model here at Tetsu College today? Today and tomorrow, have a Tetsu club where different students are able to come, where Lotha students, Angami students, Chakasang students, two, three of you. If you know the language, say, listen, I'll teach you a song, come. Songs are such good ways of learning a language. And the final one, the final point is so important for Anaga society. It is to say that it's okay, it's acceptable for an adult, right, who is 30 years old and cannot speak mother tongue, to say, listen, there is a center, come, let us go and speak that language together. Many times I have 
realized that the reason people don't speak or don't even try to speak is because of the because of the shaming. I speak Lotha, but when I speak Lotha, there's also a tendency, right, to be constantly corrected. Languages are evolving and it is okay to have many terms, it is okay to have many ways of speaking. And I think these are kind of the very quick five suggestions and I call upon really huge, amazing student associations that we have like the Naga Students Federation to make sure that this is taken as a priority. We need to work at that scale. I really agree with what Dolly has mentioned. Working, I think, as students here, we all have an important role to play in just mobilizing our groups, our peers within our circles, and just keep on speaking that language as much as possible in all circles and all whenever, wherever you can get the opportunity to call your friends and speak more about of your language. Um, any more questions from the audience? Okay, there's one here. You can pass the mic at the second row. Oh, wait, I actually have another question. Uh, thank you so much for answering my question with such heartfelt answers. So my other question pertains to disabilities, especially mental disabilities. Mental disabilities, whether it be depression, anxiety disorders, or intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities, aren't even acknowledged sometimes as disabilities. As a Naga society, we tend to blame bad spirits or demon possession to explain these mental illnesses. Since mental illnesses and disabilities aren't always visible, what are some steps to make these issues more visible socially? Thank you. Um, there are different kinds of disabilities. And um, intellectual disability is something that uh, it is very uh, not so easy to you know to notice unless you spend a good amount of time with somebody. And um, in Naga society, I think uh, those people who have mental illness or mental disabilities, uh, in Nagamis we call them pakala, pakali. We use a lot of negative uh, terms to address this kind of people. And I think in all our tribal you know, languages, we have this negative uh, connotations for this. So I think uh, one thing, one first thing that we need to do is we need to reconstruct those terms that we use to, uh, to call somebody pakala, somebody pakali, uh, and see whether, uh, what kind of uh, disability they have. Because uh, even under intellectual disability, or even under developmental disability, there are different spectrums, there are different types. So it is very, very important that we need to know. Uh, talking about the negative, uh, negative uh, stereotyping that we have, if somebody uh, is not in a very uh, correct uh, you know, form or state of mind, we call them 75, 75, and I think all of us as a people, we are 75 or 50 in one area or other. We need to acknowledge that. All of us, we have our own disabilities. So all the disabilities may not be visible, but we have as people, we are not perfect. So I think acknowledging the fact that we are also imperfect in our own way is very, very important. Another thing is um, if there are people uh, struggling with depression or mental illness, I think it is very, very important that they also seek, uh, you know, trained professionals. In my interaction with many families, we have seen how, uh, you know, they have taken their uh, children to prayer centers. They have taken their children to those uh, kabiraj. They have taken their children to those local healers. So I think instead of, I'm not saying that I don't believe in prayer, I do believe in prayer, but I think there are scientific way of, uh, you know, testing. There are scientific way of helping those people who have mental uh, illness and mental difficulties. So we also have, um, you know, people who are uh, very uh, distinguished and they, they are very good in their work, particularly uh, those psychiatrists and psychologists, I think we should take professional help from there. But I think at the community level, we have to go beyond uh, beyond that stereotyping one another and accepting the fact that 
all of us, we are 50 or 75 in one way or other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. I think the gentleman here in the second row had one. Um, I, am, okay, I think I'll make it short since we're running out of time. Yes, so I'm a PhD scholar from the Geneva Graduate Institute. Um, and I'm an environmental anthropologist. Uh, good to be here uh, listening to the panel. Uh, my question actually comes around, and first of all, thank you, uh, Dolly, for bringing up this idea of nature, forest, and loss in indigeneity. And I think this is something that a conservator had actually brought it up, that we might be losing our culture by virtue of losing out on a lot of our uh, uh, conservation. I think you touched that point. Um, so my question basically is around this notion of decolonize, right? I mean, it's been passed around so much and there's movement for decolonization, uh, moving away from the global north to the theory building the global south. So what will it be for educational institutes, uh, for example, who are talking about decolonization, right? I mean, where do we draw the line when we're talking about the decolonization? Um, is it an idea? Are we talking about practices? Are we talking about... Uh, for example, Christianity itself comes in that. So is there a risk in actually kind of touching upon that? Because we cannot separate Naga society from the Christian culture. Um, the second thing is, I'm glad that you touched upon the story of storytelling, and that's one thing I've been struggling to find out, a way to actually engage with indigenous knowledge. Um, and could you elaborate more on that to go into theory building? The second question is for KB, and I think uh, I really enjoyed the way of kind of thinking about education and how we're using the idea of indigenous knowledge. Um, the use of village that you have put sounds very interesting. And to, do, to go into the future, we need to look back into the past. But in the process of actually going into the future by looking at the past, is there a tendency that we might be over-essentializing this idea of village? And how do we draw the line? Because uh, for example, a village and a community, there is something called values, and values are political, it's shared. How, how do we draw the line, kind of, and how is your organization sort of engaged with the fact that you have so many tribes, and you're using the word uh, language, uh, sorry, uh, village. And the last one is for K2, and I think, thanks for the talk on, um, um, on uh, disability, and I think, what is the research? I think for me, I think it's more about research. How, how is the research on disability being by Naga scholars based on initial kind of uh, first hand experience? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we have we have a minute to go before it's lunchtime. Um, and I'll keep it very short. Thanks, Sean. Um, his dad was the chaplain of Patkai Christian College when I was a student. And, and uh, you know, I still remember um, Sir Paul Raj and all the wonderful conversations that I had with him. And I see that he raised his children well. So you are, you are now a PhD scholar at the Geneva School of Graduate Studies. And your questions, I think, are very genuine. And it comes from a deep place of thinking and introspection. And I will once again fail, like I often do in in, I think, giving you an answer, because this is really a part, you know, of a process that I'm living through right now in this life, and in this period of my life. So, first, very quickly, I think you ask about decolonization. Decolonization has become part of, really an integral part of the curriculum. At the University of Melbourne, where I'm a professor, with all my colleagues, it is so important for us, I think, to consider what's happening with global universities overseas, was definitely, you know, most of them situated in the West, but with the with the surge, right? Like Kate said, of of indigenous staff, students, professors, this need to know that we need to break away from a really Eurocentric pedagogy and understanding. That's within the university university structure. But for me, when I say I'm an indigenous scholar, what does it mean? It means that it's a living practice where I'm situating values of where we are. And I go back to the example that I gave of maybe uh, Reverend Longri. This is a time globally where everywhere we read, we are reading about ceasefire in Gaza. The demand for it, the demand for peace, for justice. Reverend Longri was one of, I think, the leading Naga thinkers who talked about ceasefire during a time when Nagas were really going through a very heightened sense of militarization and conflict. He, along with many other Naga thinkers, talked about peace. 
I often say that as a scholar from South Asia, the Naga world has so much to give in the realm of peace, of justice, of human rights. And this is what it means actually to decolonize, then to bring in the thinkers and to center it, not only in the context of India as Naga scholars or as scholars working on Naga issues to see what we have to offer, but how do we center it? I say that because often when scholars, students read my book, it is really the indigenous scholars who are sometimes not able to grapple with how is it that Dolly can theorize from Dimapur. I wrote a book on Dimapur, by the way, and it was published by Oxford University Press. And I wrote that book because I was tired of people all over the world asking me, where the hell is Dimapur? And I promised myself that one day I'm going to write a book about it, and I wrote about it, right? So I think it's that kind of challenge that we need to have. So decolonization as practice. When it comes to, I think, Naga culture and the, and the equation with Naga people and Christianity, I think we just had a co-panelist who spoke about the animist culture that Uncle this year had, and what did it mean? Uh, I met uh, an elder, a Naga elder in Dimapur, who went, uh, who went through severe pressure from the churches to convert just before she died. Um, we have Nagas outside the state of Nagaland. Hello, do you know that? Yeah, you do, right? We have Nagas outside the state of Nagaland who are practicing Buddhists. And we will have Nagas who will claim themselves to be atheists. So perhaps for us, thank you for throwing the question, the process of decolonization maybe is also to make who we are and our past, our present and our future a little bit more complex and to understand how is it that we see the future. And definitely it'll be challenging, but I think that's the way to go. So maybe I'll stop here, but we can have more conversations later. I'm just gonna jump in here um, as you answer the questions posed by the gentleman. Um, I'd like to request, owing to lack of time, just if everyone can also just make their closing statements, if any additional statements you'd like to add, and then we'd try to wrap up this session in the interest of time. And Dr. Dolly can close with her opening statement as well after this. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll keep it a short brief, but happy to continue the conversation after. So I think the question was about uh, why do we put so much prominence on the village or the village state. The, re the reason I put it that way, I framed it that way, is because that is a formation of our identity. So when we're saying that we are Naga, that is a fiction. So as you rightfully said, it's a, uh, it's a political construct. Um, so what ties us together? One is the struggle for self-determination, uh, the political struggle that we've had. Uh, and secondly, it's the values that we derived from uh, the village state. So that what's common between our different tribes is that the peak of our society or the sovereignness of a society came down to the village. And therefore, the values and the education that was imparted to the community stems from uh, propagating or uh, keeping alive that uh, organism. So that's where I say we lean back into the village. And very quickly, how do we rationalize that? Well, we look at the world that we are in today. And some of those value systems no longer are compatible with the world that we live in. So we come from a patriarchal society. It's no longer compatible with the world that we live in and needs to be eradicated. So in that sense, we need to look at our value sets, our value systems. How is it compatible with the world that we live in? We need to go through a process of rationalization. Uh, a process of discernment, uh, and in addition to looking inwards, what are we adopting from the world around us? You know, uh, uh, we have uh, uncontrolled capitalism, we have uncontrolled individualism. How do we discern when we're taking in other uh, uh, worlds, uh, uh, other thoughts, uh, other practices? How would how we discern what is good for our community? And I think that's only left for us to decide. So we need to develop the skills to be able to discern and rationalize those. So I think it's a, it's a process, and uh, it'll be an ongoing process. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, regarding research on disabilities, I think uh, among the Nagas, this is a very under-researched topic. Um, I may be wrong, but I have not come across any uh, research on this. Uh, there was a um, BD thesis done by a 
Sumi Pastor, I forgot his name, on the role of family uh, in giving care to persons with disability. But apart from that, I think uh, there is no study on uh, persons with disabilities in Nagaland. Uh, we have a children, uh, children's book by Madame uh, Esteran uh, Kire, uh, Different Strokes. It's a children's book. And apart from that, we don't have much literature on that as well. But I think uh, this will be my closing statement. I think this is one very important uh, area of research uh, You know, scholars can think about. Another important thing that we need to connect disability with uh, the Naga society is that we have had a you know, long history of conflict and this Indo-Naga conflict also had a huge impact particularly on mental disability, intellectual disability and physical disability of the Nagas, uh, most, uh, particularly those people who were involved in the freedom fighter. So I think this would be also one area, interesting area that any interested scholar can look up to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to all the panelists this morning. I think I've learned so much and I hope all the students and everyone here has also had a great learning session. Uh, the conversation can go on for hours. I know there's just so much I think that we can talk about. Uh, please feel free to carry the conversation over lunch. Uh, we all, we are yet to hear from the two student respondents too. So I'll just close the session for now and um, hand over the rest of the time to our host, Dr. Nozanino. Thank you so much to Dr. Dolly Kevisato and Dr. Ketukri. Let's give them a round of applause for us. <laughs>